Okay, Thanks, just the, one more fee. Thank you, Chairman. And, uh, thank you, Mr. Gallagher. You're, you're very welcome. Thank you. You were involved in the bailout negotiations in 2010. Yes, I suppose that would be to elevate my role too greatly, but there were some legal issues arising, and I have some knowledge of some of the issues that arose, and I'll help if I can. Thank you. Uh, did the ECB get its own legal advice on whether it was constitutional for Ireland to impose burden sharing with the banks? I have no idea of that, and that was never communicated. But it was never raised as being a legal impediment, and it was never communicated to me that the ECB felt it couldn't legally be done. Okay. Well, Mr Cardiff, in his written evidence to us, on page 88, or 188 of his long statement, said that the ECB informed him that under Irish law it would be unconstitutional. And his response was to effectively threaten a referendum. Were you made aware of any of this discussion? No, and time? I don't know how the, uh, the... That may have... Sorry, I don't want to uh, impute anything to the ECB. That would be quite improper. I, I would be surprised if the ECB were purporting to advise us on what was or was not constitutional. It was quite clear to me from any interaction I had with Minister Lenehan that the objection was not a legal objection, that the objection was that they were afraid of the contagion of the markets. And I think it was mentioned that uh, Secretary uh, Geithner in the US was totally against it, and I think he acknowledges that in his book, The Stress Test on the Crisis. So if the ECB had had this discussion with Mr Cardiff, as he alleges, that would have been improper on their part? From well, a... I, I don't want to say improper, because they, they may have had some view I just don't know, but I certainly wouldn't have agreed with it. Okay, and was, uh, that no... certainly wasn't given to me as the basis. Okay, that was never communicated to you. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, now you talk then about your concern uh, in your opening statement on paragraph 55 about protecting Ireland's legal autonomy pursuant to the European Union treaties in relation to the corporation tax rate. What was the concern? Well, as far as I know, that was a very real concern. And I think it affected the way the matter was handled. That was a matter for the politicians as to whether they said they were in negotiations or not. But I know there was a concern to protect whatever leverage there was it was felt that if we said we're in negotiations, then you're just there for the taking. You can't negotiate anymore. You've said you're going in, and they set the conditions. And Minister Lenehan told me that there was very considerable pressure for Ireland to forego its tax rate. And the view was taken that not only was this wrong, but the economic revival that the package or the bailout was meant to encourage would itself be undermined if Ireland had to forego its autonomy over that? That was a very real issue, as I understood it. What was the legal position? I mean, surely... We were absolutely entitled to maintain it under the treaty. They couldn't affect it, but people saw this as an opportunity. You want a bailout, you need a bailout, and we're going to impose this as a condition. So they could have said, you will now agree to do this, and that would then have become a term of the bailout. And were you aware of, of which countries in particular were looking for this quid, quid pro quo? I'd be unfair to me to say, I, I think some of the major countries that have been given out, if I could say about that, for a long time, and if you go back to the record, I think quite a number of countries, including, I believe, Germany. Uh, but I don't want to say, because I, I can't remember now which countries, and I don't want to create any storm that anybody had any particular animus, but certainly people that were competing with us saw this as something very important and as a quid pro quo for giving us the bailout. And, and then does this explain perhaps the delay in, in willing to agree to enter negotiations? Absolutely. My understanding was the view was taken by Minister Lennon and the Taoiseach that if you say, yes, we're now entering in negotiations for bailout, whatever little leverage, and you have very little leverage in that situation, was gone. And then they start imposing the conditions. So once the Cabinet made the decision on the 21st of November to enter negotiations, that was off the table? As I understood it, we had made it clear. And I think I remember, and I could be wrong on this because things fuse in your mind, I was certainly present when... Minister Lennon spoke to Commissioner Wren that night after I think I went over to his office. It may have been mentioned, but there was also some other mention about the IMF were looking for some legal priority that I didn't understand how they had it, and I wanted to try and understand that, and I spoke with the IMF later that night. And it may have been mentioned then, but it was quite clear that was not on the table, and that was not something Ireland was going to agree to. Okay, and then just in, in, in terms of the, the memorandum of understanding that was agreed, the legal position of that, in terms of if a country fails to meet an objective under the... You get your money. You don't get any more money. And that was a, a legal watertight. So when it comes to then um, January, February 2011, and the agreement that was already in place for the capital injections in the banks, is it a straightforward thing for the minister to say, I'm going to wait until the new government comes in? Or, or did that have to be renegotiated under the MOU? Um, 
I don't want to get involved in the political issue. My understanding is the Minister spoke to the Troika and indicated that it was appropriate that a new government should have the opportunity of making a determination of that in democratic terms. That's my understanding. So the MOU allowed us to... Well, there was some flexibility, and I think that's clear. You could talk to them, and indeed changes were subsequently made. I think the important thing was you communicated with them, you maintained their trust and support, which was vital. And I distinctly remember Minister Lenehan communicating that to the um, uh, Troika, and he did so on the basis that he felt democratically it was appropriate that the new government would have the opportunity of considering that and addressing that. In, in terms of the legal position, are we to understand the MOU like a contract under domestic law, that if there's to be a re renegotiation, it has to be agreed by both sides? Is that exactly. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. And just a final question I wanted to ask in relation to the details of, of, of what's contained in the MOUs. I mean, I think we're aware with the, the higher level, de level details, like, for example, that um, sale of state assets, half the proceeds would be used to pay off the debt, mm -hmm. you know, trying to find... Um, Lower, lower costs in the legal services, for example. But one requirement I was interested in was the requirement in the programme for an economic analysis of the potential impact on competition and consumer prices of eliminating or relaxing the floor space cap on retail premises. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? that, that uh, I, I remember that has been an issue, yeah. I have to say I didn't focus, but I knew that. I think certainly it rings a bell as an issue, uh, Deputy. Do you remember where it was coming from? Was it coming from a particular country? It might have been, uh, and be, again, it would be unfair for me to say it, but certainly I think they thought that that was a restriction. And, of course, at the end of the day, the Commission had to be satisfied that that was a restriction. That's where it's come from. Whether it was being influenced by another country or not, uh, I would only be speculating. Did they think it was a restriction on certain companies outside of Ireland doing business in Ireland? Uh, that would be as presumably one of the, uh, and just generally in terms of fostering competition, bringing down prices, so the bigger, presumably, the operations, the better opportunity there was for competition. There was a serious concern, of course, that Ireland over the years had lost its competitiveness, mm -hmm. and the, this was one of many measures, I think, designed to restore it. So I assume it was in that context, but I wouldn't have been involved in that level. And did anyone raise uh, anything about the ability of Irish companies to compete, compete domestically against foreign competitors coming in? At such a large size, yeah. you know, as we were going to lift the, uh, the cap on the floor space. Well, I suppose if you um, believe in competition, as people did, they had to uh, compete. Um, I'm sure there were negotiations on a lot of those things. I wasn't privy to that, or what issues were raised, or whether um, issues were... Everybody, I assume, the department was dealing with the detail of that and was doing the best it, uh, it, it could. Are you aware of any other requirements... Thank you. Any other requirements in the programme for assistance? that were being driven by the concerns of countries who wanted their own companies to be able to get into Ireland or benefit from the situation? I'm not aware of that, but I wouldn't have looked at the detail of all of the conditions which were economic matters or what, so that could be true, Deputy, but I just don't know. Okay. I wasn't involved in those negotiations, nor did I have to regard to that sort of detail of what needed to be done to comply with the Troika's terms. Okay. Thank you.